<laughs> I hope you have color at home. I really do. Isn't that a beautiful coat, though? Yeah. That's, that's Made by Congolium. <laughs> Anyway, you sound in a good mood. We have a good show tonight. Uh, I mentioned last night on the show, our executive producer, Mr. Fred DeCordova, is being followed all over, I guess, the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. People Magazine is doing, I suppose, a big, big article. In depth. In depth. And today they captured uh, Fred making the weightiest decision of the week. Should he drive to work in the Caddy or the Mercedes? <laughs> 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 You know what? You're out here a lot of amount of town. One of the things you, you can see if you want to go out to the beach now, the whales, this is true, the whales are migrating. What a... <laughs> Nothing funny about a whale migrating, but... They go, they pass down, I guess they go down to the Gulf of Mexico, and they're about, they weigh about, what? They're 50 feet in length, weigh about 40 tons, and I guess they go down there to mate. Um... <laughs> I'm trying to... You know how whales mate? They only... Well, they only have one position. And... Unfortunately, this was recently learned by a nuclear submarine. <laughs> they had uh, a big earthquake in Hawaii yesterday. Did they not? Something like 6.8? You know what? Uh, they have great entertainment in Hawaii, but you don't want to stay there while the hotel is doing the hula. <laughs> <laughs> Surfers finally found the perfect wave. It came out of the bathroom sink. <laughs> Today is the day I believe that they uh, sponsor the Great American Smokeout. Yeah. How many of you are familiar with that? <laughs> okay. Last year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of here. Last year, apparently, 4.5 million smokers stopped smoking, made it through the entire day. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. How many of you are... Uh, let's take my own poll here. How many of you are trying to quit smoking? Nobody? <laughs> How many have been able to quit? <laughs> How many are busy trying to quit breathing in Los Angeles? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I observe the smoke out. I got up this morning, I put my cigarettes in the drawer, went outside, took a big, deep breath of fresh ocean air, and chewed the railing off the porch. <laughs> I have some good news and some bad news. Well, the bad news, as you women probably know, the ERA amendment was defeated in Congress. The good news is Congress has to stay in session because they're scared to go home to their wives. <laughs> going through the supermarket checkout line today. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I saw a tableau. It had my picture on My little small picture. Not a big picture. And inside, this was interesting. How many of you saw that article? It has to do with my relation to former President Nixon. <laughs> they followed the lineage and apparently Richard Nixon and I our cousins. <laughs> True, it's just quite, it's quite now, it's about eighth cousin, but we are cousins. And as soon as Nixon heard that, I got a call from Nixon's lawyer, and uh, Dick wants 10000 a month for shaving cream. <laughs> but I... Uh, let me, let me make this perfect clear. I am not a cousin. <laughs> the big picture in the newspaper today was the picture of President Reagan. Do you see that? They released a picture on the wire service that showed President Reagan, Reagan putting out acorns for the squirrels outside of the Oval Office. Apparently, he goes up to Camp David, brings the acorns back, goes out, puts them out for the squirrels. And George Bush got very angry. Said the president's trying to strip him of all his jobs. <laughs> That's so... Unfortunately, the squirrels could not eat the acorns because all their teeth fell off from the jelly beans the president gave them last year. <laughs> you ever try to gum an acorn? Uh, now, 
<laughs> the president has been feeding the squirrels, I guess, for three years, but he has not been able to win them over. Squirrels keep asking, what happened to the guy with the George accent who, who raised the nuts? <laughs> Okay, we try. Uh, on the political scene, um, Alan Cranston from uh, California, as you know, is running for president. And did you see he has a new look? He's dyed his hair black. Yeah, he's going, he's going after the youth vote. And I don't mind him dyeing his hair black, but to compete with Jesse Jackson, he also got a Mr. T Mohawk haircut. <laughs> Alan Cranston said that the movie The Day After will probably help his campaign. John Glenn seems to think that the movie The Right Stuff will help him in his presidential campaign. Uh, Harold Stassen is hoping that they'll reissue Golden Pond. <laughs> I wasn't too sure of that one myself. Uh, Mondale is after the youth vote. Today he filmed a rock video with Michael Jackson. <laughs> When I get close to one of these, just let me know. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Jackson is seeking the older vote. Today, he got the support of the last surviving ink spot. So it's really starting to... <laughs> All right. Anyway, we got a good show for you. We have a lovely lady, beautiful actress, Miss Lynn Redgrave, is here this evening. We have, we have a very... Very funny young comedian who's been with us several times, Jerry Seinfeld. And a charming gentleman by the name of Ernest St. George. He is 92 years old. He uh, is responsible for quite a few inventions. He was married, I guess, for the second time when he was 87. So I guess he's considered a newlywed. Uh, and the Mighty Carson Art Players are going to yes. take another shot at him. So we'll be right back. Over you. Hello there. Who are you? Good show. As I mentioned, this first gentleman, he's, uh, he's 92 year old. He was an inventor from Houston. I don't know whether he's still active uh, inventing or not, but he's had a very interesting life. So we thought you might like to share some of his experiences. Would you welcome Ernest St. George? <laughs> How are you, sir? Very good, Johnny. Very we good. We just had a chance to uh, briefly say hello in the in yes. the make in the makeup room. Have you ever had makeup on before? Oh yes, well, yeah. about uh, seventy years ago. Yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was in vaudeville. And of course, That's, uh, somebody mentioned you were in vaudeville. Yeah, yeah, What'd yeah. you do in vaudeville? Well, I had an act, a uh, big act. Yeah. I was closing. I put Ken Murray in show business. Is that a fact? Yes. He was nineteen years of age. It was nineteen twenty-five. And uh, I was in New York, got from Australia to New York, and uh, I was looking for a comedian. So right. my agent told me, there's Ken Murray around looking for a job. Right. I said to Ken, oh, I looked, interviewed him, and he said, very good. And I said, how much? He said, oh, I want $100 a week. Wow. I said, all right. <laughs> That's pretty good-sized money in those days, wasn't it? <laughs> Ken Murray did the blackouts out here for many, yeah, many for years, didn't he? For yeah, about yeah. 20 or 30 years. Yeah. What kind of an act did you have? I had a, it was an act... I tell you how it happened, Johnny. I was an electrician, and I wanted to come to America at any cost. We you were in Australia at that time. We were in Australia, and of course you can't, you couldn't. Nobody can get an American, especially in those days. So I said, "Well, let me make a vaudeville act." And the actors got in. You right. see? So I made a vaudeville act, and accidentally I tipped a statue over and broke to pieces. And I said, that's what I'll do in my vaudeville act. And I did it. I made a, made a statue, a real woman, fell right. over, broke to pieces, come back together again, and went down and bowed and won. And that's the way you got to this country? That's what I did for 15 years. Well, that's good. That's, I didn't know that. You, were, you mentioned in makeup, you said you had a few butterflies now. Oh, you down there? Oh, oh, plenty. Really? <laughs> <laughs> At 92, I thought you'd seen everything. Nothing yeah. would, nothing well, would give have. you the butterflies. I've done everything, too, Johnny. Everything but prostitution. I've done yeah. my... <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe time left for that. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> have you um, have you uh, watched the Tonight Show at all? Oh, hell the time. I'm yeah. your pet. Really? It's the day since they kicked car, uh, Par out. <laughs> I waited for you, for, and it seemed to be a long time. But finally you came on, Yeah. and I watched your show for 25 years. Well, that's 20... remarkable. No, Isn't what I like, no, thanks. <laughs> There's one thing you do, Johnny. Yeah. When, you, when you lay an egg, you get out of it so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we lay a few of those once in a while. Uh, you, how do you manage to stay up that late? You, you, how do you oh, stay so healthy? Well, no, in Houston, well, now, in Houston. Yeah, That's 10.30 in Houston. comes on That's at 10.30. Right. That's see. right. And, uh, oh, I always found time. Now, I, I really... You look in uh, remarkably good health. Oh, I am. Any tricks? Oh, I am, Any tricks Johnny. to staying healthy? Yeah, well, I work very hard. Seven yeah. days a week. Nighttime, I have a couple of snops, a couple of good martinis. And then sometimes, yeah. sometimes... A little sex. <laughs> Good for you. That, that beats uh, Jane Fonda's workout book, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Just, that keeps the heart going, doesn't it? A little, uh, yeah. little schnapps. No, no, a little I'm sex, maybe, too. I don't know. Yeah, it does. <laughs> no. no, you were... This was your second marriage, I understand. Yeah, second marriage. I was married for 65 years. Mm -hmm. My wife died in Hong Kong. And uh, I came... With, I would make many trips to America. Because right. I was a broker. See, I was exporting. Uh -huh. And uh, my great friend of mine... A great friend of mine... Curtis, Helen Curtis, and she said, Ernie, I want you to go to Houston and meet a little lady. This is after my wife died. You are 87 about, at that time. Uh, yes. And uh, so I went to Houston and I met the sweet little lady three days after I married her. <laughs> three days? Yeah. That's well, not exactly not. what you'd call I'm, a long a courtship. How come so sudden? Well, uh, I was anxious to get married. I was married <laughs> 65 years, and then to stop, it was, oh, it was pretty tough. Yeah. It was really tough, do you see? And especially, I've got to tell you this, my wife in Hong Kong, she died. I made, made a trip from America back to Hong Kong, and I told the nurse, I, she had two nurses, and right. she was very sick, and I had a look at television, I was looking at television, and she died. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the sad part. There was nobody else in the room when she died. So when I called 999... The uh, uh, priest, everybody was in the room, do you right. see? And now they accuse me of killing them. Oh, no. After marriage 65 years. So I had to go to, oh, so finally Good. I got out of it, yes. That's the law over there. Nobody was witnesses to me. I see. Well, that's remarkable. Yes, I would never have thought is, of such a thing. Oh, that was a bad one, you know, and I oh. thought that. So finally, that's when I came back, and then well, two days after, I met Vera. And then I, got I, married I met your wife in the hall a moment ago. <laughs> you did? She looks did you like a her? very lovely yeah, lady. Yeah, lovely, lovely. How's the marriage going? Okay? Yes. Yeah. 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 Johnny, you look terrific. <laughs> yeah, you don't. <laughs> you look terrific. Now, look, I'll see you. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to learn how you do this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any fights or anything? No, no fights. No, okay. No, no. We're going to come back. We have to do a commercial, then we're going to come back <laughs> and talk a little bit. Okay, stay where you are. We'll be right back. You just join us. We are talking with uh, Mr. Ernest St. George. Let's talk a little bit about these uh, these inventions. They gave me a, a couple of things to ask you about. Now, uh, you had something to do or invented a uh, 05 recording camera. Yeah, that's right. Now, what was that? That's a camera that, uh, getting near the end of the war in in Europe, uh, the Nazis had a hidden secrets for their gasoline and their planes. Right. And they were playing hell with the Russians. Is he well? They couldn't. The Allies couldn't couldn't find them. Right. But when they put my camera, camera that I invented, uh -huh. on their put the seven foot their seven twenty nines, they found them. I see. When they went over next day and bombed the hell out of them, so that, that my camera settled that. Well, now, I know that. now, after the the Europe was gone, and now we're speaking about Japan. Right. The. Uh, uh, Roosevelt wanted to do it the hard way, go in with troops mm -hmm. and go and take it. Now, they, he could have done it with the, my camera because they, they could find out where the, where the, the Japanese had there, there and find it and then go over and bomb instead of killing millions of people. Right. Well, the bad luck, what, that Truman, uh, 
Roosevelt died right. and Truman come in. Well, what Truman did, you know, he yes. dropped the bomb right. and killed thousands of injured, millions of Japanese poor kids and right. everything. See, of course, and that was the end of you that. You thought your and camera might... That was my contract because I had a $5 million count contract going to make, my, to make these cameras to find them. Uh-huh. You so, see, and so. of course that was all cancelled. When Truman yeah. got in, do you see? All right, now, what's, the, what's about the car heater? The what? The newsreel camera and the, oh, yes. the car oh, heater? Oh, yes, I made, before I made this camera, I made a regular newsreel camera. Two of them I sold NBC after the war. They had two of my cameras. I didn't know They're that. Regular. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we may be using him right here in the studio. <laughs> So you invented that, huh? And sold yeah, it to NBC. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been mixed up with a lot, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, done pretty good, but spent the money. I'm a bouncing ball. Up and down. I made a number of fortunes. Oh, up what, to a million what? dollars, but I lost them all. Oh, I'm what happy ha about losing them. What? <laughs> yeah, I don't mind it. Really? <laughs> I'm making one right now. Oh, really? Making a television camera. It's fabulous. Every... every Newsreel man, not newsreel man, every cameraman right. has a camera, Bradley. Well, I'm making a motor he can put attached to his camera and make his own commercials, his own, news, his own stop motion, yeah. his own cartoons. Have you been doing this since you were a young man? Yeah, yeah, since I was 12 years of age. I've had film in those hands 90, and 80 years ago. Yeah. Uh, how, did, how did you manage to lose, uh, make money and then lose it? What would you invest well, in? Uh, well, such as with the wire recorder. With the, with the, right after the war, I had a million dollars. A wire recorder. That was the first, uh, yeah, before the tape. Yeah, tape. I wire. remember those, a little thin well, wire. Well, right after the war, I had a million dollars, a big machine shop, and everything going good, and I, money, I had swollen head, and money was burning in my pockets. Yeah. So I said, oh, so I got a license, and I made wire records. The first one to make wire recorders. Yeah. I got a contract from Sears Roebuck for uh, half a million, and they waited in line, blocks long, yeah. to buy them. And they bought him and bought him, and then all of a sudden they started to come back to see us. Now, see us getting, getting many as they sold back. The reason why? They were no damn good. Oh, oh, well, that's... That's a fact, Joe. That'll, that'll put a crimp in the old inventor's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, here's the secret, John. You see, wire. Yeah. There's one wire and there's the other wire. Yeah. Well, we say that's sound, that's music, right. and that's speech. Yeah. Well, that music went through to that after sitting. See, it magnetized. Now, with tape, it can't do it. Ah. So because it's insulated by plastic. Yeah. See, these are sound with tape. Yeah. And, and there's plastic there. Yeah. <laughs> so it can't do Didn't it. work, huh? Didn't work. Well, billions of dollars oh. was lost. They lost, she is dead, lose six million. Yeah. And I lost a million and a half. Yeah. Not kidding. When you had money, did you go out and spend it on yes. silly things? Yes. Uh, no, yeah, it's a little. So They're like what? Oh, well, no, not exactly. Silly, I'd buy... I, you know, take a lot of people out to eat and, and do all that and have a few drinks and may have hit, hit a bus or something with a car and then paid my way out of it. <laughs> See, I'm getting some belly out. Oh, oh, oh. Johnny, I'm writing a book. You, you writing a, a book about book this? Oh, you've got to take me back here when I write that oh, book. Oh, sure, sure. You will? Oh, yeah. I'm going to hold you now on your word. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. okay. I'm committed, I guess. Yeah, you heard yeah, it. I heard him. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm a witness. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be all about your life and your career? and Yes, everything. Right up from when I was 12 years of age. Yeah, well, you've well, seen I a lot. I was a projection, assistant projections at 12 years of age. You've had Truly a lot of things. in Australia. Is there anything now in 92 years, or anything you're looking forward to doing you have never done? Any challenges? No, now? I've done everything. No, yeah. truly, John. Everything. Really? I'm going to repeat it, but prostitution. But prostitution. But may have shot at that. Yeah, well... So there's a... Oh, didn't get a laugh. No, well... Uh, didn't get a laugh. <laughs> well, you haven't worked in 70 years. You know, you, look, you lose your timing after 70 years. You can't, just, you can't go from vaudeville in 1983. And, uh, you ever thought I of going back? I played Palace twice. You played the Palace in New York? Yeah, yeah. Oh. oh yeah. Headline, huh? Oh, yeah. Do I had some big ones on. I played a Van Skank played with Whew. Eva Tangway. Now, you, you can remember some I remember those names. Eva Tangway. Tangway. Freddie knows. Um, Freddie knows. <laughs> Freddie used to bring pizza up to Eva Tangway at night. <laughs> <laughs> but those were big acts. Uh, Johnny, yeah. let me go before I lose them all for <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's nice to have you. Like Really, I like enjoyed one. talking with I, you. And when you do the book, oh, you'll come back and we'll talk about you. the book. Thank you, John. Go I on. want to tell you one thing. You're yeah. fabulous. Well, it's very nice of you to say. In the bottom of my heart. I've loved you for years. Thank you. And when I saw you today, I know when I saw him, I, I recognized him immediately, do yeah. you see? But you have <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to repeat. 
Yeah. I'm going to repeat, there's no one living, no comedian living. Yeah, you can well, take your, not you can take them all. Yeah. Burns them out. Take any of them. No one gets out of a out of a mess but you. Well. <laughs> I thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Mr. Sainsbury. If you watch, yes, you may applaud Doc Severinsen and the great NBC orchestra. If you watch Monday Night Football regularly, you know that Howard Cosell recently took a two-week vacation and O.J. Simpson filled in for him on the air. We wondered what would have happened if during Cosell's vacation he was replaced not by O.J., but by another celebrity from outside the world of sports. Hello, everybody. I'm Stu Nahan, and it's a beautiful night for football in Los Angeles. The temperature about 62 degrees. As usual, I'll be doing the play-by-play. -play. But filling in for Howard Cosell is our new color man this week, William F. Buckley. <laughs> Good to have you here, Mr. Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Nahan. I'm extremely gratified to be here this evening. In fact, as I was entering the City of Angels, I was reminded of nothing so much as the immortal words of Julius Caesar, who was, he was crossing the Rubicon, turned to his centurion and said, Jacta Ali Est. <laughs> the die is cast. Oh, yes. Uh, we've got a pretty good matchup tonight, don't you agree? Well, I would postulate that both sets of gladiators, if you would let me continue in the Roman metaphors that were, are indeed reasonably comparable in their level of athletic acumen. But Jack Youngblood, Jack Youngblood of the Rams is down on the field. Can you see what that injury might be, Bill? <laughs> well, it appears to me that Mr. Youngblood might find it uh, difficult to exercise his conjugal prerogative. Uh, I don't quite follow you. He got need in the macadamias. Oh. That young blood appears to be okay right now. All right. Los Angeles is lining up in a nickel defense. Well, as you know, I'm opposed to the nickel defense. I prefer tax-free municipal bonds. They provide better capital growth investment. Indeed. Right you are, Bill. Uh, there's a fumble right there. Carl Eckern for the Rams. Picks up the ball, comes up with it, and he's down to the Seattle 45-yard line. Boy, for a linebacker, Eckern can really carry and lug that pigskin. Well, as my esteemed predecessor, Howard Cosell, would say, that little simian can accelerate with considerable velocity. <laughs> Hang on a minute there. There's a flag on the play well, right I, down I there. I certainly hope it's not an American flag. I mean, given the national media's obsession with espousing third world causes. Oh, well, what do you have on tap for us at halftime tonight, Bill? Perhaps some NFL action of some of the week's highlights? I'm going to debate Billy White Shoes Johnson on whether or not Socrates approved of spiking the ball following a touchdown. Uh, about the cheerleaders? Do you have an opinion about those cheerleaders down there? Well, Mr. Nahan, I can only draw a parallel between the proportions of their memory development and the configurations of the Egyptian pyramids. <laughs> what, what exactly do you mean? I beg your pardon? I say, what exactly do you mean? Uh, they've got a great set of honkers. All, all right, we're back to the action now. Let's take a look at it. There's the snap, Paragamo, and he's rolling off to his left right now. To, to the left? Please don't associate me with anything that... Might be going to the left. I can't stand it. Good night, Mr. Nahan. Thank you very much. We'll be right Nothing back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, Cliberty. A silly idea, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Buckley at the football yeah. game. There's the kickoff. Uh, we are back. Uh, um, of course we're back. Uh, what does I say? Lynn Bredgrave is going to be with us shortly, but right now we have a young man who has been with us before. Uh, he's a fine young comedian. Tomorrow night, November the 18th, he's going to be appearing with Andy Williams in Emmonsville, Indiana. 
November the 19th, you'll be at the Marriott Hotel in Santa Clara, California. And on December the 3rd, you'll be at the Fairmont in Oakland, California. Would you welcome Jerry Seinfeld? Jerry! Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you something about television. It's getting scary. I was, I mean, it's getting scary. I was watching, uh, that's incredible. They had a guy on who caught a bullet between his teeth. I'm not making this up. Anybody see this guy? The guy catches, this is his act. He catches a bullet between his teeth. Number one, how do you learn to do this? <laughs> do they toss it to you a few times? What's, throw it at the guy. What's the warm up? Put it in the gun. Okay, Bill, this one's gonna be coming a little bit faster now. <laughs> You know what I really feel badly about that? I, I can't remember this guy's name. He caught a bullet between his teeth. You know, I saw him do it, I forgot his name. Now, if he knew that I forgot his name after watching him do that, wouldn't he feel like, what the hell do I have to do <laughs> to really impress this guy? Catch a cannonball in the eye? I'll tell you this, if you're a burglar, this is definitely a house you don't want to break into, you know? You don't want to surprise this guy in the middle of the night. Have to shoot him in the bedroom, he comes walking out. I think you got the wrong house, pal. What was that, a 22? I hate those. <laughs> I go to the movies a lot more than I used to. I love the movies. So although I find the theaters confusing, sometimes I sit there and I don't know if I'm in a specially selected theater or just a theater near you. <laughs> I used to be afraid of the theater near you. How do they know where I am? What if I move? <laughs> Everybody knows the specially selected theaters because they have that very expensive candy, you know. You know you're going to get killed on the candy price when they put it in the glass case because now they think they're selling you jewelry. I got to walk up to the guy. I'd like to see something in a milk dud if I could. Uh, nothing too garish, of course. Sometimes the guy will take out one milk dud, put it on a black velvet display board there. <laughs> Gee, that's a beauty, honey. What do you think? That's a two-carat dud. Take a look at that. <laughs> We've been looking around a lot. I think we should go for something nice. <laughs> and who buys the horse bucket-sized popcorn? <laughs> need that quantity of anything it's a huge it's an ins it comes with ear hook things that you can put it on there kind of wear it like a feed bag it's <laughs> it's gotta be the people that sit in the front row you know you sit in the front row you're watching faces 20 feet tall all that time by the time you get out to the candy counter they give you popcorn that big you go yeah that's about right thanks my head is this big right uh, the important thing is to go out. Go to the movies. Go wherever you go. You know, get out. People, you know, it's a, your clothes like getting out. You know, it's the biggest... Because what do they do? Your clothes, their entire lives, they wait. <laughs> Everything in your wardrobe that you're not wearing right now is home, waiting, hoping to get picked tomorrow. <laughs> That's what... <laughs> You know what your clothes like the best? Laundry day. You know, that's when they get to do things and you wait for them. You put the clothes in the machine, that's a nightclub for clothes. It's dark, you're dancing around in there, you know. <laughs> they always seem to be having such fun. The shirt grabs the underwear, come on, babe. And then an article, there's always an article from someone else's laundry, ends up in yours. Hey, who's that? Good dance. I wish I had that much fun getting clean. I stand there in the shower. Shower can be a little weird. Ever have, uh, I had some people staying over my house one time, and you ever have this, you go, they go in the shower, and then you go in the shower a couple hours later, and one of their little hairs is stuck on the wall. <laughs> the shower. You know, you want to get rid of it. But you don't want to touch it. I don't know.
know how it got up that high in the first place. <laughs> and we have to do, you have to do something, right? And we all do the same thing, I bet. First, then you take the shower head, aim it at the hair. <laughs> that never works. You have to get a pool of water from under the shower and over to the hair. Get it down a foot at a time like that, but you don't have to touch it. That's the most important thing in your life at this time. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's clever material. Oh, thank you. Good, thank clever you. stuff. I feel funny tonight. Where's that? I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get out of a... I got robbed. Uh... Somebody mentioned that to me. Yeah. Really? I really did. That's I'm... dramatic. It's very... Uh, you know, it was my car. They took the uh, stereo out of the... You know, they break the glass and they took the stereo out. And so my friends, you know, they said, you got to call the police. So I called the police. I told them the stereo was stolen out of my car. They were, of course, shocked. <laughs> They never heard of a thing like this happening, <laughs> yeah. apparently. I had to console the officer that I spoke to. But it's just nothing that can be done about it, yeah. you know. We live in a huge city here. It's, it's not like Batman where there's four crooks. Everybody pretty much knows who they are. You know? <laughs> what was it, a Sony? Probably the Penguin. You know? The Joker got that, yeah. yeah. That's the trouble with those things. You put that, they, they spot that stereo and yeah. rip city right now. Always trying to protect your things, you know, like... Yeah. But it, it doesn't work, you know, I mean, like, uh, this is a dumb thing I always do when I go to the beach. You know, before I go in the water, I put my wallet in the sneaker, you know. <laughs> Who's gonna know, right? <laughs> what criminal mind could penetrate this fortress of security? <laughs> That's really A1 safety. Yeah. Yeah. Or okay. I put my TV set in the back of the car. You ever move a TV set and you put it in the back of the car and you put a sweater over it? <laughs> Just a couple of sweaters, that's all. One of them happens to be square with antennas. It's a sweater. <laughs> Who would know? Yeah. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Good stuff. My next guest, I'm sure you all know. Lynn, Lynn Redgrave, as you know, is a, a very talented actress. She's had great success in um, films, television, the theater. And she comes, of course, from a legendary theatrical family. Her father, Sir Michael Redgrave, has written a book called In a Mind's Eye, an autobiography, an actor's autobiography. She's here to discuss her father and his book. Would you welcome Lynn Redgrave? Good to see you again. Thank you. Yes, nice to be here again. I want to ask you about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Because sometimes when children grow up, they find out they find out more about their parents later in life. Yes. Than they do when they were young. I found out that was true with my father as I got older. Yes. There's things I didn't know about him. Did you find out things that you were not aware of? Yes, I... I hidden I, secrets I or something? Well, I don't know about hidden secrets. There was... Uh, there's a certain episode in, in my mind's eye, which I suppose I sort of knew about. And yeah. that's... Um, when my dad played in As You Like It in right. London many years ago, in the, th I guess, late 30s, I suppose right. it was. I'm trying to think. Yes, it was, because it was when... Um, and Dame Edith Evans, who was then not Dame Edith Evans, played Rosalind, and she was 50 at the time. Right. My father was considerably younger, and apparently she gave the most breathtaking performance. You know, you forgot in a second that she was 50. You believed she was a young girl in love. And it turns out that, yes, she was in love. She was very much in love with my father, uh -huh. and they had long correspondence and many meetings and, and a very close relationship indeed. And I don't think I really knew that. What do you say many meetings? I mean, I'm not... Well, trying. I'm a British, you know, Johnny, and I don't like to talk about these things too boldly. I mean, you'd say an affair, I suppose. You'd just go right out and call no, a no, spade I'll... a spade. No, no, I'll... maybe a liaison or something uh, yes, like Yes, you are. You put it so nicely. Yes, a liaison. Yes, a liaison, yes. So, uh... But, uh... I had a suspicion about it because, of course, I'd always heard about this wonderful production, which I was not born. I wasn't born at the time. Right. But when I was um, 20 years old, I was in a production at the National Theatre of Great Britain where, of Hay Fever, and it was directed by Noel Coward himself. Mm -hmm. He wrote it, of course, and Dame Edith was to play the leading character. Maggie Smith was in it, myself. And 
She was very strange to me, Edith, at the time, or Dame Edith. She right. was, um, she called me the little red grave girl. She had this extraordinary <laughs> voice. <laughs> the little red grave girl going to wear that dress. <laughs> she got very upset. I had a scene where I had, I was given, it's all in the 20s, and I right. had this beautiful sort of petticoat um, yellow thing that right. frothed around, and I was given this one single white ostrich feather. And I loved it. I loved playing. I played this terrible flapper called Jackie, right. who had a lisp and called me this bliss all the time. And Noel Coward was wonderful to me, dear and encouraging and fabulous. And he liked me very much. Right. And she got very upset. She saw this feather in the scene. She Distracted. Said, Just a minute. No, a little red grave girl to wave that during my line. <laughs> <laughs> and was very upset. She, I don't think she... <laughs> is, and I began to think, why does she not like me? Why? Why? Yeah. I'm Michael's daughter. And then I thought... Ah, and that's when I think I knew. She thought that you might have known about their... I think she was just jealous. Really? I, that I was his child and uh, yeah. and uh, anybody close to him, I think. Yeah. Was your father a difficult man to live with? Very I guess difficult. Actors are not not easy to live with. They're not. They're Let me ask you something. Do you ever fall in love with one of your leading men? Talking about your father? Uh... Well, I tell you, I fell in love with my husband while working with him, but he was playing a guy who was gay. Uh -huh. So isn't that interesting? He was calling me sweetie. He thought, you see, he, we were in this television play together, yeah. and um, I was playing a debutante, and uh, sort of, you know, British and all yes, like that. Right. And he played my assistant, who kept calling me sweetie. Mm -hmm. And he said, hello, sweetie. Well, you've, you've seen my husband. He's, yes. he's bearded and quite masculine yes, looking. Right. I hope you like this description, darling, if you're looking. Yes. <laughs> but prior to that, did you prior ever to fall that, in love? Um, I think I... Or have a crush, or... Uh... Yes, I had crushes. I tell you who I had a crush on. I had a big crush on James Mason in Georgie Girl. I had a mammoth crush on him. And, of course, I was several years his junior. Yes. And he was sweet to me and, and dear. And uh, I really was... I was mad about him. Did you have many meetings? No, never any meetings. <laughs> Only on the set. Never any meetings. No meetings. I like that term. Just I'd, a... I'd rather quite a few meetings, A few you know. meetings. <laughs> Well, you know the old Hollywood term. They're always saying, I'm taking a meeting. Taking you know, a agents meeting, always yes. say, I'm taking a meeting with the head of Fox. Well, Time for we know what meeting. they mean now, don't we? Uh, certainly like to meet you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's a whole new meaning whole now, new doesn't meaning, it? Yeah, yes, yeah, I'll yeah. never be able to say anyway, this again. Anyway, how, uh, how was your father difficult? It was when he was working, I assume, well, and in, involved in a uh, He was very schizophrenic in his behavior. If he was playing um, Strindberg or Shakespeare, one of the Shakespeare... Something heavy? You know, something really heavy, or a murderer, or right. anything like that. He was impossible. Brought it home? Brought it home. Thing? Lived it. Brought it home. We would get up in the morning, the three children, Vanessa, Corinne, and I, and it would be tiptoe, you know, shh, father's playing last night, shh. And if we made any noise, which, of course, we did, being right. children, this huge voice would thunder down. It was very frightening. I mean, right. I used to be very scared of him when he played those. But if he was playing a comedy then, of course, then he was yeah. the great father, you know, going for walks and her head was back. And, and we used to bring home, any time he'd play Broadway or, or come to Hollywood and make a movie, he'd bring back the latest hit uh, album, you right. know, from musical shows. And I remember when he brought back Guys and Dolls, and thank God when he brought it back, he was playing a comedy because he then right. played the album to us and then played all the songs. And we used to sing. If you can imagine the three little British Redgraves singing, I Got the Horse Right Here in three part harmony. <laughs> nice. It was good. It was nice. You'd have liked it. You'd have put us up. <laughs> Coming from a theatrical family, was it almost. Uh in the cards that you would become an actress? I mean, Well, I thought on. it, I think, because everybody said to me, I suppose you're going to be an actor, and my sister was always expected to be an actress. Right. Always. And my brother, I think, they expected that. Right. And I kept saying, no, 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 because I was shy, and also I didn't want to do the same as all those generations. Were you, shy? Were you, you know? shy? Yes, I was very shy. Yeah. But you know, when, when um, at home, my brother and sister were always play-acting stuff. This was before we didn't have television until we were about... I suppose when I was about 13, my father finally succumbed and put a television in the house. Right. So we did a lot of entertaining ourselves and play acting. And interestingly enough, my sister, whose politics I'm sure you have heard of, used to play the President of the United States in most of these things. Those sketches yes. I wish I'd have seen. They're, 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 you'd have liked these sketches. Those sketches and my died. brother would be the Speaker of the House or something like that. That's great training. And I would be the butler or the dog <laughs> or, or something like that. So Ooh. I don't think I, I don't think people expected very much of me, you know. Aren't you going to do Cleopatra coming up soon? You know, I am. And on, you know, the, you showed the cover of the yeah. Book, but it's a wonderful picture of my father yeah. as Antony in Antony and Cleopatra, and I'm about to play Cleopatra. The, uh, on the stage? Uh, no, on, uh, on television. Television? There's a company called Bard Productions oh who are putting all of Shakespeare's works on video cassette you know, and distributed through Encyclopedia. Do you know I don't have an Antony yet? You I'm don't have available. an Antony? No. 
Are Friends, you Romans, countrymen. No, no, wrong play. That's wrong Julius play. Caesar. <laughs> but it's it's not bad. It's pretty. Well, who knows? I could give it a shot. You could, would you like to? I it might be a little old for Anthony. We could have some meetings. Me ha. <laughs> Nobody's nobody explained the part to me like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to find Anthony, and then I'm going to find Anthony, and then I'm going to start right after Thanksgiving and give my Queen of the Nile. Oh, I like that. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Thank you, Doc. We're back. We have about a minute. The book is just out.